Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. My name is Ufoma Oyibororo, and here at the School-Based Health Alliance, we would like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar titled Parent Engagement in SBHCs. During today's presentation, attendees will learn strategies to enhance the clinic experience for youth and parents alike, no matter if they are over-engaged parents or the under-engaged parents. Content will include best practices for adolescent confidentiality, as well as how to navigate tricky conversations with parents and adolescents. Before we begin, if you are viewing as a group, please open the chat window by clicking on the chat icon and type in the name of the person registered for this webinar and the total number of additional people in the room. This will help us with our final attendance count. The School-Based Health Alliance is the national school-based healthcare advocacy, technical assistance, and training organization based in Washington, DC. The School-Based Health Alliance works to improve the health of children and youth by advancing and advocating for school-based health care. As youth-friendly and accessible settings, school-based health centers are uniquely positioned to deliver high-quality, confidential services that equip children and adolescents with the information, tools, and support they need to be healthy and safe where they are when they need it in school. We believe that all children and adolescents deserve to thrive. When health and education come together, great things happen. Now we have a few housekeeping reminders. All attendees are in listen only mode. However, we want to hear your questions. To ask a question at any point during the webinar, please use the chat tool located in your Zoom control bar. We will address questions following the presentation. Also, at the end of this webinar, attendees will be asked to complete evaluation poll questions. Please let us know how we are doing. Your feedback is vital and is helping us, is vital in helping us craft presentations that meet your needs. This webinar is being recorded and will be archived on our website in one to three business days. Please also visit the School-Based Health Alliance website for additional archive webinars for topics such as the ones you are viewing on your screen. Now I would like to introduce our presenter for today. We'll be hearing from Valerie Gavilla, a program coordinator with the Adolescent Health Initiative in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Valerie? Hello, thank you. All right, I'm gonna get my presentation up here. All right, hello everyone and thank you for joining me today. Um, again, my name is Valerie Gavrilla, and I am a program coordinator here at the Allison Health Initiative. And today we're gonna to talk about parent engagement in school-based health centers. There will be some poll questions sprinkled throughout this um, presentation, as well as some discussion questions. So feel free to chime in whenever um, those questions come up and as well if you have a question throughout the presentation as well. So before we begin, I just wanna give you a little bit of background about the Allison Health Initiative, if you're not familiar. So AHI is based out of the University of Michigan, but we provide training, technical assistance, consulting, and resource development to healthcare providers, health systems, and youth service organizations across the country. So you can see from the map that we're serving in over 40 states right now. And our vision is to transform the healthcare landscape to optimize adolescent well-being and young adult health and well-being. So the objectives for today's session is to um, be able to recognize and implement the best practices for teen confidentiality and risk screening, identifying strategies for engaging parents in their child's health care, and learning about available resources for parents and providers alike. All right, so as we begin, of course, we need to start with a definition. So what is parent engagement? So I borrowed this definition from the CDC and it fits well into what we want to discuss today as parents play a role in the multiple layers of the school environment and contribute to the overall well-being of their adolescent. So 
So you can see from your screen here that parent engagement in schools is defined as parents and school staff working together to support and improve the learning, development, and health of children and adolescents. So I want to start with a poll question right now. So wherever you're working in, if it's an SBHC or a health center, how do you feel about parent engagement? Are you the frowny face, the neutral face, or the happy face? You can vote with the letters A, B, and C, or on the poll here, you see the frowny face, neutral face, happy face. So take about 30 seconds to pull in of how you're feeling. All right. And I do think that the School-Based Health Alliance will be broadcasting the poll when it's uh, finished. All right, so we're pretty evenly split. We have 25% frowny face, 42% neutral, the leader there, and 35% happy face. All right, I think that's pretty good to start here. Excellent. All right, and hopefully by the end of this webinar, maybe we can get a little bit more uh, happy faces by the end. All right, so we're gonna dive in into what in parent engagement can look like, and we're gonna identify them as these three levels um, throughout today's webinar. So one of these may seem more familiar to you, the type of work that you do, but just as a disclaimer, this does not mean that every parent, of course, fits into nicely into one of these um, definitions. This is really a continuum and it's based on a number of factors. And also just because a parent fits into one of these categories does not mean that it's a good or a bad thing. It just affects how the interaction that you may have with them. Obviously there is no perfect parent or parent relationship and we're, that's not what we're trying to get at today, but we do wanna talk about the strategies of what you can do um, and what some of these um, types of engaged parents may look like and how it impacts up the work that you do. I also recognize that sometimes in school-based health systems, um, you probably do not see parents during a typical visit, um, especially you know if they sign the consent to treatment form and you just see students or patients during the school hours. But there are a variety of ways that um, SBHCs could be utilized by parents and teens. So even if some of these scenarios are not how you run things at your SBHC usually, um, you can still think about how the strategies or principles could be useful in your clinic. So you can see in your screen on the left side here, that you have the under-engaged parent. So this is maybe a parent that, um, you, it's maybe lacking a little bit of the parent connection with the teen. So maybe a parent that you never see, or this is someone that you're trying to get a hold of and you can't. And then moving towards the middle, you have the parent and teen partnership. And this is where the teen and the parent have equal responsibility and investment on the well-being of their teen. That's kind of the ideal in the middle. And then finally, over on the right, the over-engaged parent is someone who typically takes control of the parent-teen relationship and gives little independence or voice to the teen. So we're gonna dive deeper into each of these categories today. Um, and then more specifically, we're going to um, see how it impacts specific components of adolescent care. So starting with, um, on your screen here, how does a, an under or engaged, an under or over engaged parent affect adolescent care? So as a provider or a staff member in an SBHC, when you have an under engaged parent, you may notice that the patient that you're seeing has a lack of support or guidance from the parent. Maybe they're falling behind on their immunization schedule, or maybe the teen is making some risky decisions as all teenagers do, and they would really benefit some from, from some parental guidance. Another issue that could arise could be getting, you could only see a one-sided perspective on a situation. So obviously as a provider, you want to trust your patients, but teens are still developing and learning and there's a certain amount of information that a parent um, can fill in the gaps for. So for example, you may ask your patient, are you taking your asthma inhaler every day? And they, the teen says, of course I am. But if the parent was there, they may say, well, he forgets to take it to school every day and that's when he has his asthma attack. And then lastly, especially if you are um, if you are encouraging your SBHC patients to connect to outside resources, um, you can get frustrated by the lack of action on the parent part to achieve these outcomes. So 
So such as if you want the teen to get mental health counseling outside of the SBHC or making sure that the teen has all the adequate resources that they need and you're not hearing from the parent or not the parent's not following through, that can be frustrating. As well as the other side of things, having an over-engaged parent, that parent that maybe is too invested in their adolescent care may pose its own challenges, such as if a parent refuses to leave the exam room, that does not allow for any confidential time with the teen and the provider, um, which is really a crucial time for the uh, teen to bring up any health concerns that they may not want to talk about in front of the parents. Additionally, if a teen is not able to talk to a doctor alone, they're not learning the skills of advocating for themselves and learning some independence in this process as well. So if the, this can obviously affect their relationship with the provider and the teen, if the parent's always the one doing the talking, then they're not likely to bring up anything in their, um, bring up anything on their own to the provider and they're not getting those skills as well. So of course, this is just a list um, of a few things, but I wanted to ask, the poll the audience or just ask in the chat feature, what else would you add to this list? So I'll give everyone again 30 seconds to a minute if you want to chat in your answers, which I'm sure everyone may have some really good examples if they want to put in the chat here of like how this could affect adolescent care if you have the under-engaged or the over-engaged parent. All right, I'm seeing some really good answers pour in here. I see that we have language barriers, um, the asking the survey, the consented treatment for the um, risk assessment, um, parents getting too involved or not getting um, the parents' engagement as a crisis. These are excellent answers. And of course, like in this webinar, we probably can't cover all of these, but I really appreciate you responding. And I know that those are probably some individual struggles that you have in your job um, as well. And I do hope that by the end of this web webinar that you'll have some takeaway strategies um, to help with this as well. So we're gonna march forward and we're gonna look at what this may look like um, in your clinic. So this is a video that the Allison Health Initiative did um, make and it is about, um, it is geared towards teen um, being in charge of their own health which, um, but we're going to look at how parents specifically in this video um, are part of this process. Well, I'm, I'm going to stop it about a minute in, but just we can take a look here. Hi, Oops. Yeah. Hi I'm Lenique, and I'm the Teen Advisory Council at the University of Michigan's Adolescent Health Initiative. And I'm here to show you ways to get the most out of your healthcare experiences as a teen. As much as doctors, nurses, and clinic staff want to help, it's also up to you to make sure you get the care you need. Let's drop in on Taylor and her mom visiting the doctor. So how are you two doing today? We're great. Right. And uh, you're in for just a checkup today? Mm -hmm. Yep, Taylor just turned 16, so it's time for her exam. Oh, does that mean you're a uh, junior, Taylor? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right, all right. And uh, Taylor, how are, how are things going for you at school? Uh, do you play any sports or anything? She's really good at hockey, and she um, is thinking about doing glee club, right? Oh, do you like to sing? Love it. Okay. Right. Um, and socially, how are things going for you? Do you have a lot of friends, big friend group? She makes friends really easily. She's got a lot of friends. Okay. And Taylor, uh, how about your classes, your grades? How's that going? I'm doing okay, but I've got a big math test next week. and. Is it okay if we talk alone? Yeah, sure. Uh, we do like to touch base with our teen patients for a few minutes by themselves, if you don't mind. Okay, so I wrote down a list of a few questions. Okay, uh, fire away. I'll start with the top 10. Can I tell you things that you won't tell my mom? What's covering our insurance? What about birth control? How would I get an STD test if I needed one? Am I getting any shots today? How can I get in contact with you privately if I have other questions? Did you always know you wanted to be a doctor? Okay, let's break this down. 
All right, I'm going to stop the video right there. Um, I'm sure that maybe that scenario was maybe familiar from for some of you. So it's on the slide, you say, where would you place this parent? Well, pretty obviously, you have an over-engaged parent in this scenario. You could see that the doctor kept using the patient's name when asking questions, but the mom did not get the hint and kept answering for her. Um, he also kept using eye contact and was looking right at her, but again, the parent was just firing away. So in this case, the teen did speak up and asked for alone time, which you could see that's when all her questions came out and she, that she clearly was not going to ask with her mom in the room. Um, this shows exactly how having an overly engaged parent can affect adolescent care just because if the teen didn't speak up, she would not get a chance to ask those questions. So in this scenario, what strategies could the provider or the school-based health center use to move from an overly engaged parent to a more teen and parent partnership? So I'm going to go through a few examples, but in, uh, I'll give a few scenarios, but feel free to chat in if you want to add anything else. So obviously in this case, even though the teen advocated for her own alone time with the doctor, that's probably not going to be the majority of teens or adolescents. So the provider could have at minimum asked for the patient to answer the question without the mom chiming in, and even better, asking the mom to leave so the teen could have some alone time. Um, to do that, he could have acknowledged her parents' investment in the healthcare, in her healthcare, such as saying, it's great that you and your daughter have such a great relationship, but I really want her to answer some of these questions um, and for her to answer. And finally, even better, the clinic could have had a workflow to improve this process so the clinic overall, um, so this provider didn't run into the scenario at all. So such as having the parent wait in the waiting room for the first part of the appointment. Um, and we're gonna dive into some workflow strategies as well. So for example, as one of the first workflow strategies, um, the medical assistant at the clinic might intercept the parent coming back to the patient room. And by using language like this on the slide, um, it highlights the importance of teens being responsible for their own health without the parents coming in the room with them. Um, so this is really flipping the script of giving the reasons for the confidentiality is by for teens to discuss their own view of their health instead of saying, oh, we want to ask them some questions in private as sometimes that raises, um, raises some red flags with the parent. And another workflow strategy we have here is that the health center could proactively send letters home to parents or teens that give them a heads up of like, hey, we're going to be rooming the team, the teen alone because we want to talk to them about their own view of their health. And this letter actually gives the examples of some topics that they talk about. So hitting on healthy eating, um, friends or relationships, emotions, moods, sexuality, drugs and alcohol. And that way that it also provides the parent a little background of what they're going to be talking about and as well as kind of getting the, un, the confusion or unknown idea of what um, they may be talking about behind closed doors. And this letter um, is also giving the brief outline of confidentiality, stating that, of course, if the teen discloses that they are in danger or putting someone else in danger, the provider will contact the parent, but also giving that nice little um, overview of other sensitive topics, the provider may encourage the teen to share with their parent, but it's not mandated. Because um, again, this is the time for the teen and parent um, to share as well. And this is a resource that we have on our website. If you're interested, it's under the Adolescent Risk Screening Starter Guide. Um, and again, I'll give a shout out to our resources at the end of this as well. All right, so we're gonna walk through a case scenario now. So. We're gonna feel free to think about this among yourselves um, because we're gonna be walking through a few of these and it might be hard to type into the chat box for some of these questions I'm gonna ask, but feel free just to follow along. So in this case scenario, you're a provider at SBHC and a 15 year old female comes in for a chlamydia test and is worried about her parents finding out. You explained that based on your um, school-based health center's funding and your state law, you can do the test but there is a chance that her parents may see the test results on the explanation of benefits, which is on the insurance information, if you're not familiar, if she does use her parents' insurance. So she agrees to the chlamydia test. Later that week, the parent of this patient calls the clinic and demands to know why they received an EOB for a service at the SBHC that says STI testing. So as a provider, how do you support both the parent and the patient in this scenario? 
I'm just on the screen for about five more seconds in case you want to read this over. All right. So this may be a situation that I'm sure many of you have either encountered before or you fear encountering. Even though this may fear, feel like a tough spot to be in, there are a few strategies that you can use to make this a smoother conversation, as well as set yourself up for success for the future if you're ever cut off by that parent phone call. So highlight on this slide are the confidentiality best practices when it comes to this manner. So when you do get that phone call, you can support the parent by stating your clinic's or state's policy around confidential services, um, you can, and how is the best practice to keep these services confidential. Um, also encouraging the parent to have a conversation with their own adolescent about this and connected them to resources such as um, how to do this tricky, how to navigate these tricky conversations. But most importantly, active listening may be the best tool in your toolkit. So validating the parent's concerns and speaking calmly, it can keep the situation from escalating. Phrases like, I understand your concern and you want your teen to be safe and healthy but under our state's confidentiality rules, I cannot disclose the test results um, to you, but I can encourage you to have a conversation with your daughter and share your concern. Um, again, for this scenario, the provider already took some steps in the right direction by having that open and honest conversation with the female patient first by saying, hey, we can do the chlamydia test, but just as a heads up, um, it could be on your insurance. So for the best way for the provider to support the patient, again, it's just, counseling all adolescent patients on the protections and the limitations of that are exist for their clinic or state. Um, again, for a clinic workflow, such as obtaining a cell phone number for all teen patients, um, no matter what they're getting done, so they can share that information with them, confidentiality, especially if it is sensitive test information. Um, another way is to instate universal chlamydia STI screenings um, for all patients or patients of a certain age. So that way, even if your patient is getting a chlamydia test for themselves, they can easily say, well, it's just the policy that all, you know, all 16 year old female patients have to do this. Um, and then again, training all staff and providers on the practices, policies, and legal protections and limitations. As I'm sure the parents, you know, they're not gonna probably reach out to the doctor directly or get a hold of the doctor and maybe the MA answering the phone or whoever's working in the clinic, just so everyone's on the same page. And then obviously there are a range of reactions depending on the parent. Um, so this does, I'm not guaranteed that this process will go smoothly just for the first time, but as a provider, it's important that you protect your adolescent's patient's confident and confidentiality as well as trust, especially keeping their confidentiality as a high um, importance on your list with them as well. All right, and I do see a question here on the chat that says, are there ways to navigate insurance so that EOBs are not sent home for confidential visits? Um, for that question, it really depends. Um, if, you're a if you have Title X funding, you can bypass the EOBs. Uh, we do encourage our health centers that reach out to us with this question. Um, if there's some type of non-confidential code that they can use, such as you know, not marking a chlamydia test as an SDI screening, but as health counseling or health education, it really is up to the clinic um, or their, um, their center itself to see what kind of billing codes they can use and what is um, acceptable by their, and by their institution. So absolutely bringing that to the larger conversation where you work of saying, you know, if does a health screening properly cover the billing of a STI test? And some, I do see that also the question that some billing guests do, do have a comfortable guarantee to, um, to make sure that those bills are either not sent home or they're um, also sent to the patient directly. And some states can also have um, it just be emailed sometimes just to the patient as well. It really depends, again, where you're at and what the institution policy is. All right, so we're gonna look at another case scenario. So in this one, again, feel free to think about um, the answers to yourself as we're gonna look at this together. So during a clinic visit, your 15-year-old female patient, Jasmine, checks a box on the screening tool that her family typically worries about food insecurity. You let her know that there's a community food pantry just a few blocks from the school that she and her family could use. At the next visit, Jasmine says that they were not able to go to the pantry and it's still a concern. You, as the provider, reach out to the family directly, but you just keep getting voicemail. What would you do as your next step? So first, we're going to consider a few things. 
So in this case, you might think that the parent is um, under engaged in the teen's care um, as you're, it might fit in that first box of being under engaged, but really there are a few, um, there's a lot of factors that could play into this. So if you see that um, the parent did not have any action, um, it could just be a multitude of factors such as they're in a single parent household that the parent's working two jobs and that's why they're unable to answer the phone or go to the food pantry. Or maybe there's a lack of transportation that prevent them from getting to the appropriate resources. So in this scenario, we're not really sure if you know the reasons behind the why, but as a provider, again, going back to the original question, you're gonna feel compelled to do something else at least. Um, so what are some other steps that you could take? Um, so I do have an example on the next slide, but if you wanna add anything, again, feel free to chat in as well. All right, so one strategy would be to provide a handout of local resources that could help um, and includes resources for food assistance, housing, utilities, transportation, so all of the tangible needs that a family may, may need. And this template is available on our website and free to download as well. And while we don't know what the barriers were in the former scenario, one of the barriers could have been that the pantry that the provider pointed out was maybe too far away from the family's household um, or there's no transportation to get there. So while this, is a, while this resource is great for families, you could also use it to empower the teenager to take matters into their own hands and visit a, a food pantry herself if she's able to. Uh, while there are a wide range of possible outcomes, giving families a one-stop shop for all, reason, for all resources available in that community can be a great way to connect the community resources to families and help them engage them more in their teen's health. All right, we're gonna look at another case scenario and then think about a few questions as well. So, Joe is 17 at his pediatrician's office for a sports physical. Joe's mom is with him at the visit and checks in for him at the reception desk. The receptionist hands Joe's mom the wrist screen tool and a clipboard. Joe completes the questionnaire by himself while his mom reads a magazine next to him. When the medical assistant calls Joe back for his appointment, Joe's mom takes the wrist screening survey and hands it to the MA. The MA asks Joe's mom to wait outside where they take him back for a quick assessment. Joe's mom insists on going back with Joe during the assessment and physical. All right, we're gonna think about a few questions as this as well. Again, we're gonna talk through this, but if you wanna answer in the chat box, feel free to do so. So how would you handle this situation? So in this situation, the MA has already told the mom to stay behind and she refused. So what else could be done? Again, this could be where active listening comes in and you simply say to the mom, you know, hey, I understand that you're used to helping Joe with his doctor's appointments, but 17, we really wanna give your son a chance to be independent in his health. Would you mind setting out for the first portion and then we'll bring you back? Um, that way you're reframing it as, you know, not kicking the mom out, but giving the son a chance to step up and take charge of his own health. Now, there's always a chance that the mom could continue to push back and demand to go back there. Obviously, at this point, you don't want to put your, yourself or your staff members in an unsafe situation where there's escalating emotions and tempers. Um, so if you have to lose this battle, unfortunately, that does happen um, sometimes. But as we reviewed earlier, there are some mechanisms that allow, um, that allow for parents to be more prepared for the separation. So you're not running into this as you're being called back into the exam room. So things like, um, you know, saying that paper home before time or having a policy that um, you already know that the parents already know that they're going to be asked to step out. The more that you normalize this behavior in your clinic of keeping the parents outside of the exam room and they routinely see this happening, it could slowly start a shift in the parents' behavior. And again, this does not, it's not going to happen overnight, um, but it could help as well to begin that transition to keeping parents out into the exam room. So what barriers to a confidential screening existed in this workflow? You probably picked up on a few of them, such as the confidential screening um, was given, this risk screening was given to the mom and not the 17 year old. Um, he filled it out sitting right next to the mom in the waiting room um, and she actually handed it to the MA. So by giving the teen like their own clipboard while they sit in the waiting room, it's not private enough for them to be actually share sensitive information. 
essentially because the mom could have clearly just looked over or looked at the form while he was, um, while he, um, she handed it to the MA as well. Um, they could, she could clearly see the answers if he wants to share anything. So he's probably not going to. So we're gonna look at strategies that you can use to make risk screening um, a little bit actually, or actually truly confidential. And there's a number of ways that you can do that. All right, so many clinics, like in this scenario, have barriers that prevent them from having a truly confidential risk screening process. So some of these barriers are having limited time of the clinic, not having a confidential area for the um, patients to complete the screen, parents wanting to be in the room, and patients not wanting to share on the risk screening tool um, as they don't want their parents to see, even if it is confidential. So there are many strategies that you can um, do to prevent, to at least combat some of these barriers. Um, again, preparing parents, like we already mentioned a few times, sending letters home, having a script for the MA to have for them, and just making it a general workflow policy. Um, again, creating that comprehensive workflow that you know once the patient gets there, they're automatically roomed in the exam room and they have um, their confidential survey in there. Now, obviously, at bigger clinics, that may be more doable, but at a uh, school-based health center, maybe that's not as doable, or the parents may not even there in the first place. And then also counseling all adolescent patients on the protections and limitations of the law, and really starting those conversations early. So not waiting until you already know that they have filled out the risk screening tool and have things that they don't want to tell their um, parents about, but having those conversations early and telling them, hey, if you ever need to talk to me about X, Y, and Z, here's what protections exist in you know, our clinic or our state that I will keep confidential and not tell your parents about. So having that open communication um, between the provider and the parent, the provider and the teen is super important, as well as encouraging um, the teen to be open with their parent as well. And sometimes if something does come up during the risk screening that you really want the parent to be involved in, but it's not necessarily mandated, just offering to be like, hey, could I have that conversation with your parent, with you in the room, or could us three have this conversation? And offering to help make it easier. Now, that, may, that situation may feel right um, in some scenarios, but not all, and totally up to your own discretion as well. All right, so in all the previous scenarios, we're looking at the ways to change the parent's behavior to move more towards this golden parent-teen partnership in the middle. And obviously, this is not going to happen in a single incident, and it's going, it's going to um, happen over long-term behavior change. So we have a few guiding principles to help make these changes happen. So in order to move towards this um, parent-teen partnership, you can imagine that you may utilize different strategies for each bucket of over or under-engaged parents in some of these um, cases. So such as the over-engaged parent, um, reframing the statement like they're being kicked out to making, to giving them space for the child to be more empowered to advocate for themselves can sometimes flip the situation around. And showing compassion is obviously something that you want to use all the time, but it's um, for both parents. And as mentioned earlier, um, using active listening and just saying that you understand their concern and through, oh, that we can really help um, the parent take a step back and be more relaxed in that situation. And just also putting it out there that parents are also adjusting to having a teenager. Um, and providing resources and being a partner to the parent can also make them feel supported and not just like they're not needed anymore as it happens without their transition period. So likewise for the under-engaged parent, identifying the needs and having a better understanding of what, where the parent is can be a great way to guide the parents towards the next steps. Instead of just saying that, hey, they should do more, uh, you need to provide actionable and tangible steps depending where they are in their life. All right, so here we have a um, diagram here, and this describes the ideal relationship um, of how physicians, parents, and adolescents all work together um, to inform the adolescent behavior. So you can see on the left side that the physician um, works to initiate discussions of sensitive topics, endorses good behaviors, discourages bad behaviors, protects confidentiality, 
and facilitates the adult physician patient relationship while the parent is trying is offering the high degree of supervision sets limits coaches allows for independence um, provides support and that all um, contributes to how the adolescent behaves and acts such as thinking concretely exp um, the exper experimentation um, independently seeking health advice and demonstrates understanding consequences now obviously this is going this is the ideal relationship, like literally from a scientific paper. And we know that this doesn't happen overnight or with all patients. But what we can do is see how providers and healthcare workers can think about ways that you can foster and facilitate this relationship to the best of your ability and to the best of your patient's ability as well. And there's also the natural, natural occurring process with adolescents that they're learning and developing um, all through their teen years and beyond. So this will be on a continuum as well. So again, um, ways to um, include um, parents as partners, it's just meeting parents where they're at and giving them credit and that they have a valuable role in the child's experience and as an independent healthcare consumer. And additionally, they're also experiencing their own adjustment to the child entering adolescence, which provides um, a natural opportunity to educate parents about the value of confidentiality um, for the teenager and provides a great way to um, um, start to discuss your importance in the provider patient encounter and what your role looks like there as well. All right, so I know that we talked a lot about the provider and patient and parent interaction, but I wanted to take a step back and acknowledge that there are other approaches to engaging parents that can involve the school based health center and the larger school community. So if you're not familiar, um, this is the social ecological model, which is a framework that shows how individuals and the environment interact with the larger um, social system. So this model is often used for identifying different ways that you can influence behavior change by interviewing at each of these levels. So you can see there's the individual, the interpersonal, organizational, community, and public policy. So previously we focused on mostly the individual or interpersonal strategies that you can use either as a provider or in your the, um, interactions with the parent and team. But I want to take a step back and um, also address the other organizational and community strategies that we have as well, as well as some public policy, which we already um, actually addressed a few in our um, thinking about your public policy, um, even in your organization of inter um, things like in the stating universal screenings, or creating a workflow to secure teen privacy and confidentiality all the time. So moving to the next um, slide. So this will be the this would be the organization level of that previous model. So schools are school-based health centers are obviously located within schools, and which is its own organization. So this is a great place to start to implement school-wide initiatives to engage parents. So you could do this such as encouraging parents to be part of the decision-making process at school and at the school-based health center as well. Asking for parent feedback and serving parents for their satisfaction on their adolescent's care. And this doesn't have to happen um, like just because they're not in the room. You can, um, especially when they're not in the room, you can still include their feedback then. Setting up tables at school, and vet, at school events um, for parents and just having a really a presence at school events so they get to know the SBHC and what services you provide and kind of have uh, another opportunity for FaceTime to ask you questions then. Also, we have seen SBHCs hold parent education workshops um, or other kind of workshops that the parents in that community feel like they would benefit from. And again, having, because parents obviously will have a different schedule than their student or their teenager, posting updates and events and multiple forms of communication the website, social media, flyers, et cetera. So any way to get a hold of the parents as well. Um, again, providing materials and services for non-English speaking families. Um, also having those resources on hand can really help include parents that maybe were under engaged because they didn't feel like they knew how to navigate the system, but having options that really, um, that really target those people who really um, would benefit from the, um, language barriers of how to break open those barriers is having more inclusive services as well. All right, so for one of those examples, we're um, serving parent satisfactions. Um, this is a way that they can still have a voice in the child's healthcare, even if they're not present. 
So this could be a great way for school-based health clinics if you typically do not see parents at your clinic visits to get their input as well as surveying them for community needs like workshops or classes that they would like to be offered or even volunteer opportunities. So this is a resource that we have at AHI and it's actually um, not available on our website, but if you wanna contact me, I'd be more than happy to send you a copy of this. And this is very customizable as it's just a very general, it's called Health Place 101 Report Card. But this is a great way to get feedback um, from the parents and see really what their perspective is and maybe what needs they have. And again, for those who maybe are under engaged, you can really get a sense of what they have to say. All right, and I did see, um, going back, I did just see a panel, uh, someone asked um, if a parent is interacting on Facebook or if it's a more promotional tool. Um, totally up to your SBHC's um, discretion. More prom I was thinking more promotional, but obviously if you started a question for parents to chat in, that would be also, um, you know, like posing a question every, you know, day of the week or once a week that they could chat in, also a way to engage them. Totally up to your creative um, juices, I'll let that um, be to you. But yeah, absolutely, another way to engage them. And I do see a few people asking for these, um, for the parent satisfaction, and I will do my best to get your ad email addresses at the end of this webinar, but if I don't, I'll also rely on the school-based health alliance staff to help me get that or my email will be at the end of this webinar as well that you'll make sure you can connect with me. All right and then moving towards the community-wide initiatives. Um, so your clinic may engage um, parents obviously thinking outside the box or outside the school. So inviting community partners who provide health care services um, in the community to come talk either at your school or just engage them in other ways like do um, joint events or having just their contact information available at your school and promote, promoting that um, within the school and to the providers or I'm sorry the parents and other school-wide functions and just getting out of the school as well and meeting parents where they are so going to churches libraries restaurants grocery stores wherever in your community that you see would, would be the best fit meeting them there. So to wrap up, I just want to point out a few HI resources that we have that could help facilitate these conversations. So the video that we start to watch in the beginning is on our website. Um, it has a little screenshot there, but we also have one that is focused on parents and kind of having the conversation with the parents of how it's so important to allow their um, teen to be in charge of their own health and how that has felt for them and their experience with it. And then on the right here, we do have this Take Charge of Your Healthcare poster that really provides tangible, actionable steps for ages 11 to 18 that says, um, you know, at age 12, you should um, know your medications. At age 14, you should be able to check in for your appointment by yourself up to age, um, you know, 15, 16, knowing about your health insurance and how to access that information. So these are things that really parents and teens can work on together to help make that transition as well. And these are all available on our website. And um, again, I'll put the website address under the next slide. Um, additionally, we have some starter guides. Um, we have a lot um, geared towards SBHCs as well as some other ASLIN friendly materials. And starter guides are meant to be a one-stop shop that we have all the resources and how-to guides all in one place as well. So you can find those on our website as well as AHIs, um, if you just look around the website, we have a ton of resources that we would love to share with you. Um, we do have a lot of, a lot of our resources are free. And then if you do have a specific resource in mind, you can always work with us that we um, can have specific resources made for you as well. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to just um, contact us on our website or I have my information at the end of this. And some helpful resources outside of AHI's own um, resources are the CDC has a um, parent engagement handbook for schools that has some really concrete information as well. The Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine, as well as the NIH, has um, both the confidentiality resources and how to have those conversation stories for how to have those tricky conversations with your um, teenager as well, especially for parents. So this could be something that your health center has 
um, available to hand out to parents to how to start those conversations. All right, so now at the conclusion, I want to ask you, how do you now feel about parent engagement? So we're going to start the poll again. You'll have about a minute to answer. So I want to see, we were pretty much split on um, frowny face, neutral, and happy face with neutral just edging out. So I want to see at the end um, if there's any movement. And it's totally okay if there wasn't after this um, webinar, but I just wanted to see how we're feeling now. So I'll give you about 30 seconds, um, 30 seconds to a minute to take this poll and we'll see. And in this time, I do see the question about um, permission forms or consent forms for vaccinations. Um, again, that is something that would be up to your clinic's funding and state laws. Um, we do see SBHCs that do have a template that says that they are included, but sometimes other vaccines are left out of that, such as like the HPV vaccine, for instance. Um, so again, um, that's something that's going to be dependent on your health center. Um, I will also say to address a question previously in this webinar, I saw that was, where can you find your state's um, confidentiality resources or your minor consent laws? Um, and I will say for every state, it is different, but HI does have a, um, a reservoir of information for about 12 states currently on our website um, that will have all the minor consent laws that are free to download as well, as well as sparks and activities that you can do um, with your staff to really um, make those laws and to really make sure that everyone in the clinic has a good understanding of those laws. So that's somewhere that you can access, access it as well. But if you're at a state where we don't have those resources, feel free to contact us or we can also help you maybe point you to the right direction because sometimes those are very hard to find as well. All right, so I'm happy to see that we are down to a 3% on frowny face, a third of us are neutral, and 66% are happy face. Excellent. All right. So I just want to say thank you so much for tuning in today, and um, just want to do a quick plug for our 2020 conference on adolescent health. So this is an annual event that AHI puts on, and it draws um, healthcare professionals from across the spectrum, um, across the country. And we have over hundreds of attendees and half of the sessions at our conference are co-facilitated by youth, um, which and it provides real-time perspectives from youth and how providers and health professionals can improve adolescent-centered practices. So on our website, you can see that there, we have our full two-day agenda. So you can see um, what workshops would be interesting to you. And registration is currently open and early bird rates are available through March 9th. Um, so it is just a few more days for the early bird rates. Um, it's very fun and we would really love if you could join us in April. And this is going to be held um, in Detroit, Michigan as well. So again, thank you for being a part of the session today. And my email is on the screen and I'd be more than happy to um, answer any questions that you may have. I know we have a few minutes to wrap up before I turn it back to um, uh, the School Based Health Alliance. So again, I will connect those resources with those who chatted in. But if you have any questions, um, feel free to either email me um, today or this week, or if you have any questions, feel free to chat in as well. All right, um, Valerie, if you could stop sharing so I can take over from our end. Absolutely. Perfect. Alrighty. Okay, again, um, I just want to thank you, Valerie. Um, right, one moment. All right. Now is the time to enter um, any remaining questions into the chat box in your Zoom control window. Uh, while you are entering your questions, we do have a few announcements we would like to share with you. 
please join us and become a member. The School-Based Health Alliance works to improve the health status of children and youth by advancing and advocating for school-based health care. Our members extend and support our work. Trainings like this webinar would not be possible without the support of our members. In addition, our members receive exclusive access to valuable program tools, timely publications, and networking opportunities. Please take a moment after the presentation to visit our website, www.sbh4all.org forward slash membership for more information and to join. The 2020 National School-Based Healthcare Convention will be held June 23rd through the 25th at the Sheraton Denver downtown in Denver, Colorado. Join the School-Based Health Alliance, the Colorado Association for School-Based Healthcare, and your peers from around the nation for three days of engaging workshops, networking, and fun. The theme for the meeting is school-based healthcare, elevating a school climate of health and safety. As a premier national gathering for our field, the convention is a fantastic opportunity to connect with hundreds of fellow school-based healthcare professionals and advocates from across, the nation, from across the nation. Registration is now open. We hope to see you there. Also taking place at the convention is the Be the Change Youth Training Program. Be the Change is an opportunity for youth age 14 to 18 to connect with like-minded peers from around the country who are passionate leaders of change in their schools and communities. Through exploration of health and education topics, advocacy and leadership skills development, and networking with each other and school-based healthcare advocates, be the Change gives young people a platform to expand their knowledge and confidence as directors of their own health and champions of youth voices. There are scholarships available to assist youth with hotel accommodations, and for the first 25 youth applicants will receive a discounted registration. Now we will respond to any remaining questions. It looks like there might be some questions in the Q&A. Okay. If there are no further questions, we will launch our, <coughs> if there are no further questions, we are gonna launch our evaluation poll. Okay, see, we have one. Um, for new school-based health centers, would becoming a member and attending this seminar, would that be the best? Um, yes, coming to the convention would be um, a great opportunity to network with um, other um, colleagues in the field and learn more about um, the field and how you can improve your center. Okay, and I'm going to launch our last poll for today.
Again, we would like to thank you for attending our webinar today. And we'd also like to thank Valerie again. Um, and we hope to see you at our convention and have a wonderful day.